You were born in California. Yeah, I was born in, in California. Uh, from as far back as I can remember, I love cars. There are kids that that, that happens to. There's a bug out there, <laughs> you know, where you, you have a passion for cars. At an early age in uh, oh, 06 or 07, uh, my grandmother would uh, keep me quiet in church by giving me a pencil and paper and a hymnal. So my first sketches were done uh, in church on a hymnal. Uh, that, that whole interest developed. I went to uh, high school uh, with a lot of car sketches in my notebook. I still made the honor roll and decided to go to MIT. I was determined to be an automobile designer. That was my one goal in life. And I thought an engineering degree would, would be a great background for an automobile designer. So I went to MIT. At the time I was there, I entered the Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild. That was a design competition. Design. Uh, high school kids around the country were challenged to design and build a model of this of their own design, and then send it in. And uh, a scholarship was was the award. I won that competition in 1947, and I got first place, top color scholarship, which was great because I was still going to MIT. But the best part was. They took me aside and said, listen, when you get out of college, come and see us. And that's how I started at General Motors. I did. When I got out of college, went to General Motors as a junior designer. And, uh, you know, that was, that was really exciting because of all the preparing you did, all the thinking you do about Becoming a designer, here you are, finally, a designer. Sure, you're at the low end of the totem pole, but that's, that, the opportunities were great, and uh, I took advantage of them. Now that was, let's see, so you started there in what, 49? I started uh, at General Motors in 49. That's was, a long time ago. What was that like? What was General Motors like in 1949? In 49, you, you remember the war was over. People were hungry for cars. People loved cars. And the new models were just coming, coming out in 1949. Uh, up to that time, it had been pre-war models warmed over. So the new, the new stuff was just hitting the road. And there were some great, <laughs> exciting cars. Uh, so to be in, in the design, in the design uh, section, styling section they call it then, uh, was pretty exciting experience because uh, things were accelerating, changes were accelerating, excitement, yeah, it was exciting. And uh, you know, every year you bring out something else. People couldn't wait to go down to their dealers on a fixed date to see the new model. Now all that's changed. I mean, do you remember any certain occurrence in your life that said, hey, I'm really into cars? No, you know, I, I can't. Uh, my mother tells me I was interested in cars before I have any recollection that I was aware of cars uh, from a very early age and could identify cars in that age. I guess the first that I remember uh, was the uh, experience of drawing some cars uh, they were the era of 1933, I think, 33 Chevys that were a big influence on me, and I, I drew those. That was the first drawings. But there wasn't one thing that you can say, hey, I saw a car drive by, and at that moment I knew I was no, crazy. No, no. Of course, when you're, when you're a kid like that, you don't remember uh, any particular incident. All I know was I had this passion for cars. And you pursued it. And I pursued it. Um, now you talked about how the, 
the GM design contest really gave you your opportunity. Um, it was that. Is that the way GM was finding designers then? Well, you know, that was a great way to, to identify the best young design candidates from the age 12 to 19 of, of any, any, any uh, method you could use. And there were, as it turned, and wouldn't surprise you, there were a lot of designers that came through that competition that finally ended up at GM and, and in other uh, companies and other design activities. When you started at GM, um, you were a junior designer. What, what does that mean? A junior designer means the low end of the totem pole. When you start, uh, you're, you're, you're classified as a junior designer and that's that's uh, that's fine that's that's all right because that's there's no place but up and uh, your rate of development depends on your talent and your enthusiasm and uh, and uh, a little bit of luck oh I'm sure yeah now did you have any idea who Harley Earl was at that time I knew about Harley Earl uh, for many, many years as, as a, a young boy, I knew he was the man who started this profession of automobile design back in 1927. And he was, somehow, his personality, his philosophy permeated these cars that I knew before the war. There was something about a GM car that had a quality of design or had shapes that were well executed that that appealed to me and kind of made my mouth water compared to the other cars around it. and that that really was Harley Earl so I was sort of when I joined General Motors I was in awe of this tall six foot four giant uh, named Harley Earl. Uh, it must have been a very interesting time. Do you remember the first time you met him? Uh, the first time I met him was when I won the contest, uh, the Fisher Body Design con Competition. And uh, that was just, just uh, shaking hands. Uh, but that, that brought it all home, and I thought, wow, Harley Earl. And then I, then I got to work for him. And that was, that was an awe-inspiring uh, experience. I remember the first time he, that I met him in a work circumstance. I was in a truck studio. I was assistant chief designer. And he came in one Saturday. We were all dressed in jeans because uh, it was Saturday. He came in on a Saturday to walk through the door. And here he was. Came over, sat down in front of the board, the full-size blackboard, said, Hi, fellas. And he said, no, no, this, you know, he'd sit down in his chair and he'd put his legs way up, you know, like that. S big, long legs. And he said, now, 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 fellas, here's what I want to do. And he described an El Camino. He had an idea that we ought to do a pickup based on a passenger car. That, that was back in in uh, 53 or something like that. So, uh, of course, we, we executed, we, we developed some designs. He told us what he wanted. And as we developed the drawing, he was very particular. He couldn't draw. Harley Earl could not draw. He did not sketch. But he had this unique ability to, to know or to feel what what was right to do. And he, so we were developing this design, full size, developed in uh, accurate lines. He's very meticulous about the lines. That's that quality identified when I was a, I, a kid. It showed in General Motors cars. So he said, you, uh, 
lower that roof line. That was me. You know, I, 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 I was so uh, nervous at that point that I could hardly hold the pencil still and the, uh, and the sweep to get that. He wanted it an eighth of an inch lower. And uh, that was the first experience I had, and, I, and my heart <laughs> was pounded the rest of the afternoon. Because he was such a giant. He was so, well, he was tough. He had the ability, uh, he didn't put up with any, anything but what he wanted. And uh, he'd, he could fire somebody on the spot, and he did if he didn't like what they were doing or didn't agree with them. So it was kind of a fear and trembling uh, atmosphere, although in all my relations with Harley Earl, I never got hit. <laughs> uh, because I worked hard to do what I thought was the right thing, and he recognized it as the right thing. Earl. But uh, step down in 57, is that right? Uh, yeah, 57. I think that's about right. Uh, uh, 57 or 58, actually. Something right in that area. Right? Some, somewhere in there. And uh, Bill Mitchell took over. Right. Um, now, what kind of individual was Bill Mitchell at this time? Particularly early, before he was head of, of design, what, he was being groomed along as, yeah, as it was, it was, right it was clear that, that Mitchell was, uh, was going to be the next uh, head of, of styling. Uh, and rightly so. He was a guy, he was a car nut. I mean, he really had gasoline in his blood. Plus, he was an exciting personality. And he was a type of guy that was a great leader. You loved the guy, really loved the guy. He was tough. He was really tough, but his design philosophy was to do things that were new, that were creative, that people hadn't seen before, that were appropriate to the car. And uh, he pushed that along, and we all were swept up in that, uh, in his uh, uh, draft. Uh, working for Mitchell, I guess, was <laughs> the highlight of my career. Because I, I was fortunate to uh, to work closely with him during during the, uh, the the really great Mitchell years, and uh, it was tough. It was uh, sometimes disappointing, but it was fun. What was a typical day like with Bill? <laughs> if there was a typical day. <laughs> Bill Mitchell was, was an enthusiastic car nut and, and a, a very exciting figure and, a, and a, he moved at a rapid rate. There was no slow speed. It was always a, a, a fast on. Uh, he was tough. He really was tough. He had some standards. But he, and he stood for newness, for creativity, for trying something that hadn't been done, for, for digging deep, and then uh, being able to decide which, which one's right. He was good at that. He knew when these strange things developed, which way to turn and what was right. And, and I learned, I learned from Mitchell. Uh, which is great uh, for a designer, but it was also fun. Yeah, you know, if design, if automobile design isn't fun, something's, something's not going right. Automobile design never seemed like work because you're always creating something new. You're always living in the future. You're always trying some things that, that uh, have never been done. So. That's the excitement, that's the fun of it. The satisfaction, of course, is getting your own design on the car and then seeing it come down the road. Um, you, can, you can slice, I say some of these things as I think of them because that, that's a significant part of it.
there was a story I think about you and and I think Dave Holes and, and maybe Irv Rabicki early on getting a, an advanced look at a at a fifty seven price. Oh yeah, but an Exner did. Well, I I'll well, tell you, story I know me? that story well because uh, that that was in that was in the summer of uh, fifty six, summer of fifty six, and. At noon, at noon time, sometimes I just go out to get away and I drive, and I knew there was a, a Plymouth plant about seven miles down from where our studios were in Warren, and so I just drove down and I thought I'll look through the fence and see what their new cars are all about. That was just the time they were making them. I went down there, stopped the car, went over, peeked through the fence. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Here were all these thin, uh, fast-looking, lean uh, Plymouth coupes with all these high fins. This was a forward look, the introduction of forward look. And I thought, wow, the proportions were so different, so different. We were doing thick roofs, thick bodies, heavy bumpers, a uh, uh, lot of chrome. And here was this fleet aircraft looking lean car that looked like it was moving standing still with this aircraft uh, fin on the back. After my shock, after I got over my shock, I, I got back in the car and I went right back uh, to the uh, to our building, uh, the styling building, and I got a hold of Bill Mitchell, and I said, "Bill, you got to see this. Here we were, doing these uh, cumbersome, heavy, chrome-laden uh, cars that we as designers didn't didn't like, but we were, uh, but Harley Earl did." So Bill got in the car, Dave called Dave Holes, I forget who else, but there's about four of us, and we drove down to, to the, see these cars. And uh, we all stood there. The message was clear. That afternoon, Harley Earl was on, uh, in Europe. That afternoon, Bill Mitchell, God love him, he, it took guts, but he said, let's start another 59 proposal alongside the 59 proposal that was going on. And let's do, uh, let's do a, a really new design the way we want it. Of course, everybody got swept up in the enthusiasm of doing that because we had for several years been frustrated by what we had to do for the 57 and 58 designs with all the chrome and the and the heavy vacuum sweeper grills and bumpers. So we were ready. It was like letting a lot of prisoners out of jail. And we really took off. When Harley Earl came back, he walked in the studio and was totally silent. He looked. Then he turned around and left. It took him three days before he accepted the fact that really there was a coup that was going on and that uh, the new direction, which turned out to be the 59 line of cars, was the right direction. Wow. I, there's just something about the story about the, really the, the head movers and shakers of GM driving, looking through a fence over at a competitor. Yeah, that, I mean that that's that's a romantic car story. I mean, you know. Well, you know, I, I suppose that's right, but you we were all interested. We, it, people thought we had a lot of secret uh, spy information. We didn't. We didn't know until the car came out what these guys were doing, but here's Virgil Exner in the forward look. Man, that was that was I can't tell you what, how I felt when I looked through that fence. I thought, wow, that is neat. 
everything we wanted to do was right there. You know, proportions and and uh, and character lines. And, uh, while we're on the subject, uh, tell me your thoughts about Virgil Exner. Well, Virgil Exner, I th think, was, was a great designer. Uh, and he had, uh, like we all do, better periods uh, than others. But uh, his cars, I think the forward look, I think Mitchell was the guy who said, you know, Chrysler Corporation was always struggling along Mitchell said, Chrysler ought to, ought to do a statue, a statue of Virgil Lexner and put it right out in front of the, uh, the Chrysler headquarters because he brought new life into Chrysler. It didn't last long, but during that period he brought new life. He had another period where he did a lot of European type show cars that are still good looking cars. I mean, really had the integrity and uh, and uh, and the European design flair that that was timeless, well proportioned, uh, not faddish, and uh, wore well. We were talking uh, about Virgil Exner and and, yeah. and the uh, spine through the fence story, which I think is excellent. Um, at that time. As you were saying, there really weren't, you know, people running around taking spy photos and inside information and on what other people were doing. So, you know, if you if you saw something, you you took advantage of an opportunity to find out what was going on. Is that the way it was working? Is it uh, yeah, we didn't have any any spy uh, information. We didn't really know what other manufacturers were doing, unless we went down when they started building their car and did a perfectly illegal thing of looking through the fence to see what they were coming out with, what ideas they had. And uh, that's what we did. Um, tell me, what were, what were Bill Mitchell's strong points? Bill Mitchell's uh, strong points were uh, his design ability first. He was a great designer. And he stood for uh, newness and he stood for creativity. He stood for excitement in design. He was also a good leader. He was like a Pied Piper. Man, you loved the guy and you'd do whatever he told you to do because you believed in him. You respected him for his ability and he was exciting. He was fun to work, work with. And he cemented the whole relationship in, in the styling group. And, and you've got to remember, that's not easy, because here you've got this bunch of creative, temperamental people with, with all these egos, egos floating around. And uh, he had the ability as the orchestra leader to get the most out of people, and people were happy to, to be working for Bill Mitchell. Early on, he was somewhat controversial with upper management, though, wasn't he? Or was it a well, love-hate relationship, or how did that work? Is that it depended on uh, it depended on uh, the personality of the upper management. He was very close friends with a lot of uh, members of management, but over the years, there'd be some that that thought he was too powerful, too strong. He was determined, and when he was determined. He really went after uh, uh, the prize, and uh, he may have he may have run over a few <laughs> people along the way, but the amazing thing is that uh, that he was usually right. How did his management style allow the different studio chiefs to compete but yet work together? I, how, did, how does that work anyway? I mean, how how, how does this family? Feel come well, you, you know, uh, the whole uh, design group, uh, the design staff is based on the idea of studio units. A studio is, is maybe 12 or 15 people made up of designers, maybe two or three, uh, five or six sculptors, and two or three uh, engineers. And that's a little family unit. 
that's called a studio. It's headed by a studio chief designer who orchestrates the activities. Those studios, and there were some uh, 30, 30 some studios in the building because we were responsible for all the cars and, and all the trucks. Each unit is locked and we maintain a certain uh, independence in each studio. So that family can develop their own thoughts without, without it being watered down by others seeing what they were doing or them being influenced by what others are doing. So Mitchell um, was really the guy that orchestrated all the activities that were going on. Uh, he had the key to all those studios. He had the pass key. He had the pass key to the studios, and and uh, and he he had a a great way of leading you, and then helping you decide what was right. right. If you didn't have the ability to decide, he decided. He was a very decisive guy. There was, I think. Uh, a lot of people look back on, on Bill Mitchell and they say his style was right for the time. Can, can you comment on that? I mean, yeah, yeah I, I really believe that's true. I think Harley Earl's style was right for the time. I don't think Harley Earl would make it to, under today's conditions. Mitchell's flair and his, his uh, uh, spirit in his designs were, were exactly right for for the times that he lived through. Uh, he would have a little trouble these days with uh, all the other forces that are acting on his design. He believed when he designed something, when we designed something in the styling uh, staff, that was it. Don't question it, don't monkey with it, that's it. Take it or leave it. But these days, you know, things get watered down with marketing and and um, uh, all sorts of forces that uh, platform managers and other forces that maybe make business sense but certainly uh, don't produce great designs. You know, things get a little muddier as the years go by, but... Uh, you know, we all, <laughs> we all what, forget. What, give, me, give me your take on, <laughs> on the story of the development of the 63 Stingray. Uh, there were so many people now, I think, taking a bigger claim of what actually yeah. occurred. What was Bill Mitchell's you, you role know, in that? I, I, believe, I believe you're right when you say the farther you are from where it happened and the longer it has been, the more important you become. See? And it really irritates me because I claim no credit for the 63 uh, Stingray, but I was there. I was Mitchell's assistant. So I know what happened. And every opportunity I have, I, I tell the story. That car, uh, as you remember, the, there was a Stingray race car that Mitchell did originally. There are a lot of people that claim credit for the design of that. Nobody gets credit, in my opinion, except Bill Mitchell. He described exactly what he wanted, displayed, a shaped body and the four bumps over the fenders. And he was so interested in the Corvette, he was there every day directing that design. So don't let anybody tell you they designed that. And the same is true of the Stingray, uh, the 63 uh, split window. That car, you know, that, that, was, that has typical Mitchell all over it. The, the lower body with the blade-shaped, uh, the Stingray race car type body shape with the four bumps over the wheels. And his fastback profile that comes to a point in the rear, that's Mitchell. And the fact that the, the little wind split that starts in the, on the roof goes right down through the back window in a little land, that's Mitchell. You know, he, he fought for that with Zora Duntoff, because Zora said, you can't see out. <laughs> well, there was a little truth to that, but it looked great. And for one year, he won his case. And that car now, of course, is, is one of the, the prime 
Corvette, uh, Corvette car. So in, in the case of the 63 Stingray, there were, there were those who drew pictures on the wall based on what Mitchell described, but they did not create the design of that car. Mitchell did. I think you, you hit on it a second ago, but is that the car that, that typifies Bill Mitchell, you think? Or? Uh, that had a lot of uh, elements in it that Mitchell really believed in. You know, pointed, the pointed rear. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that, that had a lot of Mitchell in it. If you knew Mitchell, you knew who did that car. How do you think, looking back now, you know, gosh, 30, 40 years, uh, how do you think he should be remembered? Well, um, personally, I was, I was very close to Bill Mitchell. I worked with him uh, during his, uh, practically his whole time. Uh, and I, in my opinion, uh, he's going to be remembered as one of the, one of the great designers great automobile designers, along with Harley Earl. Because Harley Earl was the father of this whole business and did some significant things. Bill Mitchell picked up where Harley Earl left off and did some cars that will be long remembered in the history books of automobile design. Let's switch gears for a second over to Dave Holes. Um... Yeah, there's one other thing that occurs to me that might be interesting. Okay, go ahead. On Mitchell. Go ahead. There's a, there's a story. It's not a story because I was, I was there. We were doing this. Uh, we were a thund, Ford Thunderbird had come out, Ford, Ford Place. And we thought, boy, we've we got to do something to counteract this, this Thunderbird. And so we started in an advanced studio, a four-place job. Well, as young, enthusiastic designers, this whole thing was jet plane. You know, everything was pointed in the front and, and uh, jet exhaust out the rear and fast profiled. And we thought, wow, this is great. Mitchell went to England for an auto show. When he came back, he called me in the office. He says, listen, I want you to go out there and make that car a Ferrari Rolls Royce. I thought, my God, that's it. That's it. And that's how the Riviera was born. Uh, it was a sporty, but it was very elegant. It had a little razor edge, but it had the, the look of go to it. So it was sporty elegant. And that was, that was really what Mitchell had that ability to sense things and then get them done that way. Hmm. You ever hear that story? Uh, briefly, I, no, not in that description. Uh, yeah, well, that's true, because I was, I was the guy he told. <laughs> Ferrari Rolls Royce. Yeah, well, you, and you think about it. First, it shocked me, Ferrari Rolls Royce. But you think about that for a minute, and he had just been to England, and uh, been to the auto show, and that's that's what he—that's really sporty elegance, not sporty sporty, <laughs> and not stuffy elegant. Sporty <laughs> elegance. That's right. <laughs> um, Are you listening? Yeah, yeah. He's taking I'm notes taking too. Notes. Yeah. <laughs> He's got notes. the print side, and we've got the electronic side over here. Oh, so. all right. So it's easy for him to eavesdrop on what we're doing. Um, but sometimes it takes a conversation like this to, to trigger some sure. things yeah. like yeah, well, that. Well, feel free to jump in with anything. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're here to record this. So, um, But since we're at a break here, we'll go ahead and talk about Dave Holes, I think. Yeah. Um, how would you describe Dave Holes as a person? <laughs> well, you know, Dave's a good friend of mine, and I love the guy. You can't help but like Dave Holtz. He is such a wonderful person. His laugh, his laugh in itself is infectious. and uh, He's a wonderful guy. Plus, he's a very talented designer. Very talented designer. I work, worked with him practically uh, his whole career, my whole career at, at GM. 
And uh, he's done some significant designs, uh, created some of the directions. Uh, he's a great, uh, he, he's known for, uh, for kind of a slam bang approach to things. I, some of his sketches are, are wonderful. I still have some of his, his sketches because he really had a feel for the lines and the flair and the design. Had a lot to do with, this, with the Cadillac, uh, for example, uh, 1959 Cadillac. But he, he's, he was so slam bang about things that he'd be airbrushing. You know, that's where you have a, an air source and a cup of paint hanging on this little device that sprayed a color on the illustration. And th these took two or three days to do. I mean, this is a full size, you're painting a full size car on the board. And he'd be going along and then he'd knock the paint cup off and he'd go all over the illustration. Typical Dave Holmes. <laughs> oh boy. Um... What, what, what role was he playing at that time? I mean, he was, he, he was in the Cadillac area? or Yeah, he was assistant chief designer in the, in the Cadillac uh, studio when I was a chief designer. Then, as I remember, he, he left and took over a Buick uh, studio, and he was instrumental in the second generation Riviera, which is, looks like holes. It just looks like holes. It has that thing I described, you know, that fine, uh, well-executed, but fast-looking car. It's a 59 Cadillac, obviously, but are, uh, and the Riviera you just talked about. Is there anything else that really typify his work? Well, I guess I, guess I can't, I don't remember all those, you know, after you get yeah. <laughs> Out and the years go by, I can't remember. Those, the Riviera and of course the 59 Cadillac, I remember. Then he became a chief designer and he worked in other, in other areas. But I can't name right. cars sure. for he could he well, could Those are good that. examples. Yeah. Whatever, whatever he remembers is right. You know, if I ha ever have a question about what, what, can, uh, Dave, can you remember what we were doing back then? I call him up. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, this has happened, this happened, this happened. He has a wonderful mind, wonderful memory, and a wonderful passion for cars. And, uh, <laughs> um, let's see, you, uh, you went over to Opal, right? Uh, right. In, in 1967 right. to, to 1960. And then to Dave 1970. did the same thing and later. Dave did the same thing. And this all happened because, uh, you know, Opal was a GM subsidiary, an important car in Europe. And uh, one day in 66, the boss called me in, Mitchell called me in and said, listen, kid, you're going to Europe. He said, you need some training on running your own operation. Well, I thought, yeah, okay, okay, boss. <laughs> That's great. But that meant pulling up your roots here totally because it was for a three-year assignment. It means moving your family and all your worldly goods to Europe. But as it turned out, that was a, probably the greatest period of, of my life. Uh, and and uh, the family agrees with that. Uh, we spent our time well uh, while we stayed in Europe. Plus the fact, I liked being the head man. I took it seriously. I saw it as an opportunity. And when we came, when we arrived at Opal, Opal was known as a farmer's car. You know, just a plain vanilla farmer's car. No spirit, no life, no performance. And Bob Lutz, who's now vice chairman of Chrysler, was a sales manager. So I was a director of design, he was a sales manager. That's, that's pretty potent combination. And uh, so we, we got together and uh, we were designing a new 
first thing was a new, uh, finish the GT, the Opal GT, uh, which uh, McKeegan had started, did the production version. And then we did the Manta, uh, Opal Manta, which is a significant, there's still Manta clubs in Europe, Opal clubs here too. And uh, some other significant uh, cars for the European market and a sh first show car. Uh, took it to the Frankfurt show in 69, caused a sensation because the Germans didn't believe in show cars. All of a sudden, they caught the excitement. So, you know, we, we really, by the end of, uh, well, that was the beginning of new life at Opel. Now Opel is one of the most uh, significant cars worldwide. And that gave you, well, you said the opportunity to get your feet wet from uh, really the key guy. The guy. key guy, uh -huh. to direct a group of creative people and produce significant uh, products was my responsibility and I loved that. I really liked that and we, we did some things that were exciting. The Germans, as it turned out, liked it because there was some leadership that was leading them into some new, new areas and some excitement. Okay, during the '60s, you're, you know, you're still there. You're, you're still Bill's right-hand man. Uh, he calls you in the office. You go off to Germany for a while. Uh, that turns out to be an excellent experience. I understand you weren't too thrilled about it the day it came down, but you thought about it and you thought, yeah, Jesus. it was a cultural <laughs> shock when he said uh, you're going to Germany for three years. Yeah. Uh, but once you, th once I thought about it, it. This, this was a great opportunity. You had to recognize that. How did you like Germany when you were there? Uh, we loved we loved Germany. Love loved Germany. It was uh, you know it's close enough to to all the countries, so you could you could go travel Europe in, on weekends and do things, drive on the autobahns as fast as you wanted to, and uh, but. And that was great, but the thing I really liked was being able to run my own show. Right. And I, I took that seriously, and I, I did, a, I think, a good job. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Now, you come back, and basically in your old position, or what? How, yeah, what? when I came back, there were two of us. Uh, you, know, you know, remember that after the war, from, from the end of the war up until 1970, there were a lot more models of each name brand introduced. Originally, there was one Chevy. Now there are how many Chevy mm -hmm. lines? Mm -hmm. yeah, and the same was true of Pontiac, Rolls, or any, any car you want to name. So there was more, there was more to do. We divided up uh, Irv Rabicki and I divided up uh, Chevrolet and Pontiac and Buick Olds and Cadillac. That's the way Mitchell uh, thought it would work best, and that was fine. And then after a few years, we'd switch. So we both got experience in bo in in these in the total. Uh, it really was too much for one guy to do with any amount of uh, detail and credibility. So it worked. That was fine. Now we jump forward to, I guess, what Mitchell retired in '77, I believe. Uh, was that? Yeah, I late can't in '77 or something. something. I guess. Um, and this this is more of a controversial area, but it was it was Irv and you. Yeah. It, I mean, you it, guys, you guys. We knew that. We you knew, knew that. You knew what was out there. You guys had been groomed and yeah, blah blah we, blah. And, I knew that, and uh, Irv knew that, and uh, and the decision was made by a corporate management that it was going to be Irv, and uh, that was a big disappointment for me. But uh, after a couple of days, <laughs> uh, I got over that, and uh, we joined forces and and made it work. I I then became director of design under Irv. And you know, I think I think from what I've read, and, and according to Dave Holes, uh, you know, the decision kind of caught the whole design team flat-footed. 
Because uh, it, the inside channel obviously was that was you yeah. because you had gotten along so well yeah. with with Bill. Um, and I want to wait for this to finish here. Um, but everything I've read and, and, and conversations I've had is it kind of kind of floored the department there and obviously caught you and I think caught Bill uh, uh, pretty did. stunned too. It, the but truth you, is it did. Uh, it did when he called me in and announced that. Uh, it was clear that it wasn't his decision. Uh, but anyway, that's that's the way it was. So that that was what we were what we were faced with, and I had more time to go. So um, I decided, well, <laughs> let's get this job done. Now was uh, was uh, I don't know this, but it was Irv. Was he older than you? Or about the yeah, same age? Yeah, older. Oh, yeah, okay. he was older. Yeah. Okay. You know, those were difficult days, too. Um, not a vintage period in, a, in our history uh, because of all the, uh, the regulations, the downsizing, and there was a time, you know, designers' creed, we learned from Harley Earl, the creed was lower, longer, wider. That was it, lower, longer, wider. When in doubt, lower, longer, wider. Uh, now all of a sudden, with downsizing, with fuel economy laws, with reducing the weight in the car and downsizing, it was shorter, higher, narrower. Well, for a designer, you know, that, that took a little getting used to. We didn't really know how to handle that. And there are a few cars in our history that show the fact that we didn't know how to handle it. Uh, and. Uh, they they just didn't have the spirit and the life and the, the appeal, the emotional appeal. That's, that's what a designer does, is put, put emotion in the car. And these cars just didn't have that. I was reading in Dave's new book, uh, I think you described it pretty well, if something about if, if a customer doesn't look at the car in the first few seconds and form some kind of emotional yeah. A customer has got to look at the car and something's got to happen here, you know. It's got to affect him. Otherwise, all the other features you have built in, all that performance, it doesn't mean a thing because you're just not interested. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good way of looking at it. Um, so, uh, decision comes down, you're, you're not the head of, of the of the area. Right. You, you fight with that, you come to grips with it. I come to uh, grips with it, yeah. <laughs> um, it, took a, it took some doing. I, mean, I, I must well, say I was, I was sorely disappointed. Nobody promises anybody anything, but I thought that uh, I'd worked well towards that goal, but that was not to be, so. Yeah, and, and you know, having not been there and, and not been a part of that world, I. I've, I've got to sit here and admire you for, you know, a lot of people would have walked, I think, uh, just because of the, the, the way, how long you'd been there and how mm -hmm. things had played out. But, you know, I think, well, as you said, you kind of looked at your age and you said, hey, yeah. I'm going to soldier on, at least for the yeah. time being. Um, the 80s come along, um, and it, basically early on extension of the late 70s, which yeah. wasn't much. Uh, yeah. What 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 was it like in the GM design area in that time? Well, uh, it wasn't the exciting period of Mitchell, and the uh, but then it was not only Mitchell; it was the Times, you know, doing things. Now the Times are different, and we had to toe the mark. Maybe you could say that styling or the design wasn't first priority. You know, it was tough. Back in Earl and Mitchell's days, what they said was done, and everything underneath kind of remained the same. It was a fashion business. Now we're doing cars, rational cars, to meet certain goals and uh, regulations. And the design of the car wasn't first priority, let's say that. And uh, so it was, it was a tough era to get something uh, uh, out there that, that, w that met all these goals and yet had some emotional appeal. 
Um, okay, and then you jump ahead, what, uh, 86, uh, you took over. Yeah, it was 86, yeah, 86 to 92, yeah. How did that, how did that play out? I mean, Rabicki, he obviously was shackled in some respects with a dull period to begin with. Yeah, but, but yeah. think people weren't too happy with the general direction. Uh, here yeah, you are, I guess you know. uh, when you're used to Mitchell's flamboyant flair and his enthusiasm and his ability to get you all excited and going 100 miles an hour, yeah, there it was a kind of a dull era, I, I, I must say. In fact, when I, when my appointment was announced, the first thought and the first thing I did was to get the gang together. You don't do anything by yourself. Here we have this wonderful group of creative people who weren't motivated. And I kind of talked to them. I think I talked for 15 minutes, just kind of spelling out, now what? You know, the the fact that creativity was going to be a key word. And we were going to do some things that were new and weren't going to do look-alike cars. We were going to do individual cars that spelled out the brand character. And we were going to get some flair into the thing. And most of all, we were going to have some fun again. You know, that, that was important because design is fun when it's, when it's done right. And, uh, you know, you have, you have better, some days that are good and some days that are better. And, uh, but I, don't, I want to eliminate the bad days and get everybody running together as a team and get this thing, uh, get some excitement back in our designs. Some excitement, you know, simple, some, some beauty. I mean, what, what's wrong with that? You know, that was what we, what we stand for is a design section. And uh, that's what we tried to do. And I think uh, uh, in, through that period of time, six years, we developed a number of, uh, uh, well, the first thing we did was uh, to uh, dedicate the advanced studios to doing a car for each division that represented the vision of where that division was going design-wise. We did it on our own. And uh, the chairman, who was Roger Smith, used to come out to meetings out in the design staff. And after the meeting, he'd always come over to me and say, what do you got? What do you got? I said, come on, I'll show you. And so I took him through the studio this one time, all the advanced design studios, and showed him one car each for each division that represented where we're going. These are pretty exciting cars. He said, wow. That afternoon I got a call and he said, can you, can you, uh, can we build those cars? I said, yeah, yeah, we, we can build the cars. He says, I got an idea. We're going to go to the Waldorf and put on the teamwork, put on this uh, show that showcases General Motors. Uh, at the time, GM was having a little hard time uh, with its image. So we did that, you know, and that was the beginning of, of uh, I hate to call them show cars. They were more significant. They weren't frivolous. They, they really pointed the way. And uh, we did a series of these cars, not only the, that that group for teamwork and technology, but other cars that that were shown in the auto shows are not shown. Some of them never saw the light of day because they were too good uh, to give away. And uh, for example, the last car, one of the last uh, cars I was responsible for, the you know Cadillac STS and. Uh, 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 the uh, well, I'm thinking about the Aurora. Mm -hmm. 
What were you talking about? Uh, we're going to talk about the Aurora story. The Aurora, <laughs> yeah. You, you didn't plan on this, but... Well, let's, let's have it. The, the Aurora story, the story of the Aurora is an interesting story because it, what, it didn't come from the division. It was not an Oldsmobile. It didn't come from product planners. It didn't come from some revelation uh, or a bolt from above. It came because we thought, gee, today's sedans are boring. Four-door sedans are really boring. And there's no spirit in these things. And I, I went to the advanced design, an advanced design studio, and I said, listen, guys, why don't we do a four-door sedan that has some life, some spirit, and that's exciting. People love four-door cars, but all I can buy are these these uh, ordinary, low, common denominator cars. So the guys joined in the, they got excited about that idea. I said, listen, let's, let's pretend we're Lockheed Skunk Works and, uh, that Kelly Johnson used to run. And out of that environment came a lot of great airplanes. I said, in fact, let's start the thing like an aircraft with a round section body and then Let's put the wheels where the wheels have to be, and we'll just bop out to cover the wheels and kind of get a uh, Kelly Johnson-influenced car. See where that leads us. Okay, hang on well, just a second. Hold that thought. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Um, this is the bomb. Talking about the, the Aurora story. Yeah, I was, uh, was talking about the fact that... Uh, you had the wheels in place. We, we had the wheels in place, and we really had uh, developed a, an aircraft-influenced passenger car. But we went through some, some strange, strange periods. This, this is typical of a creating, creative endeavor. The, the more you're digging, the more different you intend to be, the more you're apt to go through some uglies or some dead ends. Uh, and we did that. We really did it. Didn't matter because it was, the studio door was locked and we all knew what we wanted to do. And you win a few and lose a few. So we finally uh, got it turned around and developed a car that we called the tube car, the tube car. Uh, because of its influence, uh, because of the aircraft influence. And we liked it so well that we uh, made a fiberglass model, a dummy model. And we s painted it, finished it, put it up in the hallway uh, on the second floor where everybody had to walk by or did walk by every day. Put it on a carpet under the lights and the idea was to let some of that um, influence the other uh, studios that were trying to do production cars. Here was a four-door sedan that had some emotional appeal that grabs you when you saw it. One day the Oldsmobile guys came, general manager came to me and he says, hey, we're, we're going to drop the Tornado. Let us have that, that design outside our studio for a new for the new uh, replacement for the two-door Tornado. We want a four-door car. So we wheeled it in the old, old studio, productionized it, and, and uh, they named it, and away we went. Uh, so the it? point of that is that the creative, the creation of, of a car that has significant character is easier done behind closed doors where you can make mistakes, where you can try things, and where you can make sure you're right before you have to stand up in front of God and everybody and, and uh, develop a production car. Uh, interesting. So the name Aurora was with it then or not? When it was first? No. Called? No, it was just a tube they, car. The uh, Oldsmobile invented Aurora. <laughs> we call it the tube car only because that was a nickname that, I see. that, stuck, uh, that stuck. So you put this thing out there hoping I for didn't, what happened. I mean, you hoped yeah, somebody I, well, would come forward and we, say... I hoped it would influence what was going on in 
in the sedan design. Now, uh, as it did, uh, as it happens, it did. It, it turned out to be a, uh, and you know, now Oldsmobile's claiming that's going to be the basis for their whole new line of cars and all of that. But it never happened without the, the foresight and determination and enthusiasm of a designer. Now, what's that? That's sure. the front door. Oh. That had to been kind of a unique concept, wasn't it? I mean, uh, what the, the, the aircraft the, the, to have, have really having a studio or a group to design things to give other groups. We had we had ideas. We had six at the time. We had six advanced design studios. They were each dedicated to projects that we thought we needed to cover, not attached to any name name brand. The production studios were in a different location. Advanced studios were really, really important because that's where you could lock the door, make, make mistakes, try things, don't be afraid. And uh, it pays big dividends when you hit uh, a new direction. I think if, if I'm right, you had kind of an interesting appreciation uh, for one of the legendary customizers work, Barris. Oh, <laughs> uh, George Barris, great old George. He, he's, he's timeless, he really is timeless. But I remember the first time I, I knew about Barris, I knew custom, custom cars. I guess I knew about Barris before that because the California movement with uh, custom cars after the war, you know, where they'd clean up They'd take all the chrome off, they'd lower its section of body and lower the roof and do these things with, uh, with the wheels and the exhaust pipes. All of that was great from a designer, exciting from a designer standpoint. In fact, many of us did some of that to our own cars. So they were really influential in their movement towards clean, clean well-proportioned uh, cars. And Barris was really the, in my opinion, the leader of that group. At least he's, he's the, the best known of the group. One day I was in, uh, maybe in 60, uh, the 59 Cadillac had just come out and I saw uh, flying from San Francisco to LA, I had a magazine with a, with a 59 Cadillac done in candy apple red. Wow, you you could eat that car. You know, it looked that good. Candy apple red. And I, I asked the Cadillac guys, find out where this guy George Barris has his place. And it was down south of LA. They found out. So I got in the car and I drove down. And I just walked in off the street, you know. And, walk, and he had his shop there, and he was in the office. I walked in the office, and here, here he is doing some sketches, sitting there at a table doing sketches. And so I introduced myself, and, and, uh, and we spent some time together. And from then on, we'd been, we'd been close friends. Really enjoyed George Barris, and uh, he's such a, has such a flair. He's such a you know, he's Hollywood. And uh, in, over the years, he's, he's had an influence. He really has. He even came to my retirement party out here in Nelly. He made a little speech that was, he looks as good now as he did back then. <laughs> Maybe better, because. First started at GM, you were considered, what, one of the Young, young Turks, is that? Well, I don't know. Or, how, do, how do you know what you're Well, considered? I don't know. I, 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 that, that, I, I suppose I, 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 was, I moved up pretty fast in the organization. Uh, I, I guess I was lucky because I started around the bend with trucks, tractors, uh, trains, and did, did some things that were significant early on. So I didn't have to fight the crowd. And I... A hot uh, hopscotch uh, to a certain degree. Uh, so uh, 
I, you know, I, I guess I can't. I guess I can't. Somebody else would have to comment on that. I, I guess I just don't. I always felt fortunate. I, and I, I think, uh, looking back, uh, that I've done some, <laughs> some good designs. Some that aren't so good. You always do that. Win a few, lose a few, but but some that that are significant, and uh, and wear well and are considered part of uh, of uh, automotive history. I think also, uh, if I remember, you the the uh, the Taurus, the eighty the what? six Taurus for oh, Taurus. Yeah, you, you viewed that car very interestingly, didn't you? I mean, you, you weren't really crazy about the overall styling of it, but, but it, it, it was bold. It was different. It yeah. Was something that hadn't come along in a while. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Taurus, when I first saw it, I think it was in Chicago Auto Show, I thought, wow. You know, this is, it was called at the beginning a jelly bean. You look at it now, you can't imagine why, because, <laughs> but at the time, we were doing such sharp, crisp lines, that it was back to the form, but it was different. I looked at that and I thought, that, that could be a good one, could be a good one. And then um, I, I knew Jack Telnack, and I've always um, considered him a friend. We see each other from time to time. and. Um, so, I, the, the uh, Taurus was kind of the end result of some other events that I'd heard about before that, that Jack had told me about uh, when the, in the, I think it was a Thunderbird, they were working on a new Thunderbird and uh, the boss came in and said, hey, do you guys really like that design? They, they said, no. Well, I said, why don't you do one you like? And they did. And that was sort of the beginning of what was, became the arrow look, the softer, smoother shape. And the Taurus, of course, now as looking back, was a very successful car. Top selling car in the United, United States. And uh, a significant uh, design uh, on the part of, uh, of Ford. And that, that, that all occurred just right before, about the same time you took over, uh, and really gave you pr yeah. some ammunition to say, hey, yeah. we need to change yeah. things around here. That always helps. <laughs> when designers get together, they talk about that. You know, when somebody does something great, helps the other guys, because you can say, hey, see, look, at, look what they did. And I think that's that's happening right today. I think the Chrysler, who, who I think is the design leader today, is having a having a an influence uh, and an eye opening, and some of the other corporate uh, staffs that are stifling design. What are the other cars? Let's see. You, the list goes on and on. As you said, there's so many models in the 90s now. I mean, every yeah. car company has, you know, 11 models, seems like, almost, or variations. You know, them. people say, why can't you change cars more often? You know, like every, every year or every two years, car, back at, after the war, the cars change. But now there's so many cars, you can't afford to, you, you just, there's not enough money or manpower to uh, keep these things fresh every two years. Um, I, I think you were hitting on an interesting point about designers and, and, and when you were in control, and I've always wondered this, so that you're a perfect guy to, to answer this question from your perspective, but you said you win some, you lose some. Yeah. That's true of any company, yeah. any designer, any, any group, whatever. Yeah. Um, and when this finishes, but the question basically is gonna be, uh, for example, I, I think it's fair to say that that the 90 or 91 Caprice didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Then you come out with these home runs. I mean, yeah. you know, 
Uh, how how does that happen? You know, how, how does I, the studio do that? I mean, well, let, let me tell you. I'll tell you about two two of our losers, two that have tarnished our record. Uh, one is the Caprice, and the other one is the Ant Eater Van. With the front. Uh, the, first, the Caprice. When we when we did the Caprice, we all thought that that was it was a winner. I had no qualms about releasing that design, and it was just that people didn't see it that way. They thought it looked like a whale because it had plan so much plan in the side and the rear wheels were covered. When we uncovered the rear wheels put bigger rubber on it, and put an SS, painted out the grill, all of a sudden, all the hot shots thought that was a great car. So that was our fault. I accept responsibility for that, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. The other thing that was bothersome was this anteater uh, van. At the time, it wasn't intended to be a competition, which was really not. Not right, but it was intended to be a station wagon. It was on a passenger car, underbody, and it forced that long front overhang. Uh, so uh, maybe our choices of the lines <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't. Are you talking about the Pontiac Transport? Yeah, and oh. I'm talking about the Chevy, what they call a Chevy. Uh, Back in those days, you know when it was, you know what, you know the one I mean. Yeah, you know, it just slopes on, yeah, way down. Way on you know, and the windshield was Huge so far ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the architecture was wrong in that car, and uh, so it so, wasn't successful. So really, what I guess I hear you're saying is, you know, obviously you don't put anything out that you think is going to fail. I mean, no, you, you, no, you believe. <laughs> You believe what you do is right, but uh, like, like anything else, uh, you don't have any guarantees. So it's a lot like being an artist. You're not sure how the public's going to yeah, perceive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Or making a movie. You don't know if it's going to grab people or not. You have, if you're good, you have an intuitive feel about these things. And like a ball player or a ball team, you're, you got to have more wins and losses or you go down the tube. Uh, but uh, there, you just you just don't uh, you just can't tell. Um, who are some of your mentors? Mentor means well, who, who watched over me? Yes. Well, obviously, there's some early influences. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. The the um, of course uh, I always. Figured that Harley Earl did that to some degree because he he supported uh, my move moving up. Uh, he supported what I was doing. He even wrote me a note one time thanking me for designing the train. He never wrote notes. Still have that. So I I kind of figured he was a he was a supporter, but Mitchell was a guy. Mitchell was the guy that, you know, I understood that once I became vice president. You're looking for people that you can trust, that have the taste and the enthusiasm and the ability to create some things. You, you look for these people. They're key. They're key and you can't do it all. You're the, you're the orchestra leader. But, you, but they, these people are key. And uh, I think I probably fit that uh, with with Mitchell. Now with Irv, uh, that was more difficult. <laughs> well, definitely two different personalities involved. Um, the uh, uh, let's just open the whole game here. What are some of your favorite cards? You mean that designs, I designs anybody's I had, design? Who do you? Oh, oh, anybody's design. Over the years, I mean. Well, you know, I, I, there's there's some that uh, that stand out. There's a '49 Ford that I always thought was great, and the '61 Continental was was fine. 
I'll, I, I won't mention them all, I guess, because I don't remember, but the 63 Stingray, I thought, was a mind-blowing car. I thought it was a show car for production. And the 63 uh, Riviera was, uh, was a great car. 67 El Dorado had a, had a lot to do with that car, and I have a lot of satisfaction uh, seeing that car. Even now, it's big, but it was the first sporty, elegant Cadillac. And then, um, I guess you'd have to say, when you come to the end, uh, um, there are always, in any era, there are cars that attract you, and then they kind of fade away. I do a lot of reading. I take every car magazine I can get my hands on. Just go to Geneva Auto Show every year, just to keep up to date with the ebb and flow of, of cars. There's a little car in Europe called a Ka. K.A. Ford, beautiful little thing, whole new design philosophy. So, so things are changing, but of all time, my all-time favorite, without any question, is the Ferrari. I love Ferraris, and I guess everybody knows that. The chairman of General Motors, you see, I said, how can you like those cars? I said, listen. If you have, if you really love cars and the soul of the car and the excitement of the car, then a Ferrari, with whom we don't compete, is the ultimate. And a Ferrari has a sound, a smell, a performance, the look, all the things that are exciting. And if I ever got discouraged or, or distracted, I'd go out for an hour in the Ferrari, and bang, you know, all of a sudden, and you're, you're back on your feet, and you're excited again, because that's the essence of a car. So, uh, plus the fact, uh, Pininfarina, Sergio uh, Pininfarina was a good friend of mine, is a good friend. He's designed Ferrari since 1952, think about that. Great, great design example. You look at the history of the Ferrari design, practically all of them done by Pina and Farina, and uh, you can see a, a prime example of brand character. Each Ferrari is a new animal, but it looks like a Ferrari. And uh, that being, having done that for so many years, just an amazing example. If I wheeled out a 1963 Ferrari Lusso, that car looks as good today as it looked in 1963. Now that's, that's amazing. And uh, so I always consider the design of the Ferrari is uh, probably the prime example of good, timeless design. I think that's a good point, uh, which makes me think of something. Uh, the older I get and the more I get exposed to different things and cars and people and places, I think a test of a real timeless design is to take something from 1963, yeah. show it to a group of people, younger people particularly, yeah. who may not even be familiar with what it is, say, yeah. what do you think of it? Like, oh, that's a nice looking car. Yeah. By the same token, you can take another 63, yeah. what is that? You know, yeah, and oh, it looks old. Right, and I don't know if, if it's the times change and then they come back around, or if beauty is beauty. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I have a, <laughs> I think the latter is true. I think. There's a quality about some of these Ferraris that just are timeless. You know, they'll look they'll look great any any time you <laughs> you look at it. Um, if if you had to sum up in maybe a paragraph uh, or less, um, what was your design philosophy? Um, I think that's what I talked to the group about when I got the job as a vice president. I believe in uh, 
creativity, first of all. I think you've got to take risks and try to develop something new and have the taste and judgment to bring that into focus. I believe that it's immoral to do a car that isn't beautiful. I believe that it's a uh, that excitement should be part of this. Now, it may be elegant excitement, it may be sporty excitement, it may be functional excitement, but it's got to have uh, this emotional appeal that, that we're talking about. So, um, my push was always towards doing something new. I resisted anything that didn't allow us to to move ahead, design-wise, and uh, and I, I hope that and you know the same token we had uh, fun doing it. So that added spirit to what we were doing because we liked what we were doing, uh, and some sometimes we won, sometimes we didn't. Well, that's that's true in anything. That's true in life. Uh, just some uh, kind of off the wall things, stories that we're kind of working with. We're doing a story on uh, on the fifty six Mark II Continental. Fifty six Mark. Remember II. that one? Yeah, I remember. What do you think of that design? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. The original Continental I loved, and I still respect that. I like that design. Uh, the Mark II left me cold. I just have no, no interest in it. Did not appeal to me. I thought it was uh, just left me cold. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, everybody has a different. Yeah, I, I know. That's what makes the world go around. That's you right. know, sure. if you could, everybody has. You're never going to please everybody all the time. That's a design business. You, you try to grab the majority of people. There will always be some dissenters because that's human nature, and everybody has different tastes and different feelings. True. That's very true. You believe in young. People. Yeah, I, I really, really believe in young people and uh, I've worked with the schools uh, over the years, hired a lot of uh, the designers at, at GM. And, and so I hope, and young people are wonderful, they don't have all these hang-ups that older people have. They're doers and they're enthused about things and they, and they are excited and if our business, our business, automobile design, depends on young people. Now the leaders are younger. I'm for that. I love that. And I only say this from my experience. I don't, you know, I'm not currently doing, doing design. I've done my, but when I'm asked, I always say, you know, uh, automobile design, is one of the few professions where it's not work. It's not work. Uh, it's sure there are better days than other days, but you're always dealing with the future. You're always uh, delving into the unknown, and you're having fun. Very, very, very true. And that's true. How do you want to be remembered? I guess I'd have to say as an automobile designer that who, who did his best. I would design was in my whole life and uh, and I did what I thought I should do and the records speak for themselves. <laughs> I guess I don't know any other answer to that. It's it's a it's always a tough question to ask yourself. You know, uh, How do you want to be remembered? Uh -huh. What what do you want said on your tombstone? <laughs> <Why>? <laughs>
<laughs> fill in the blanks here. <laughs> and you got 40 seconds. And you got 40 seconds. Yeah, you got 40 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. And, and I gave you no time to even think about it. As far back as I can remember, I loved cars. I was determined to be an automobile designer. That was my one goal in life. So I went to MIT. At the time I was there, I entered the Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild. That was a design competition. I won that competition in 1947, but the best part was they took me aside and said, listen, when you get out of college, come and see us. And that's how I started at General Motors. I started uh, working at General Motors Styling uh, shortly after Chuck did. At lunchtime, we'd, we all had go-karts and we'd go out racing one of the edges of the parking lot where the cars weren't and it parked and uh, we just had a ball. I remember he uh, really messed up an expensive suit one day. Chuck uh, was raised in the era uh, under Harley Earl and Bill Mitchell and uh, he was very much influenced by them. I moved up pretty fast in the organization. Uh, I, I guess I was lucky because I started it around the bend with trucks, tractors, uh, trains and did did some things that were significant early on. Most of his original work was in the truck studio. And I know he did some terrific vehicles down there, that Cameo Carrier, which really was the first pickup truck that had the sides integrated, and uh, the Yana, La Universal uh, show car, which was really, uh, really the first minivan. Chuck's uh, career at the General Motors really emerged after his truck work. He made many, many contributions in that era. He did that wonderful Buick Centurion show card. Buick presents the sleek Centurion. And of course, he was very close to all the Camaros and Corvettes that were done through the years. I know one car that Chuck's all been very proud of is the uh, 67 Eldorado. 67 Eldorado, I had a lot of satisfaction uh, seeing that car. It, was the first sporty, elegant Cadillac. One day in 66, the boss called me in, Mitchell called me in and said, listen kid, you're going to Europe. Well, that was the beginning of new life at Opal. Well, Opal was known as a farmer's car. Now Opal is one of the most uh, significant cars worldwide. You know, under General Motors, we had always built up a wonderful identity for each division. This started way back with Harley Earl, and Chuck reaffirmed that when he took over as a vice president of General Motors Styling. Two of the cars that we were both most proud of, and I know Chuck was proud of, was the, uh, the Seville and the Aurora. I believe that it's immoral to do a car that isn't beautiful. Excitement should be part of this. It's got to have uh, this emotional appeal. My push was always towards doing something new. I resisted anything that didn't allow us to, to move ahead, design-wise. And uh, we had fun doing it. 